Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, this year's first uh, installment in our Dean's Public Engagement Lecture Series for the 2017-18 academic year. As I've said repeatedly in this series and in other contexts, it's really important that law schools interact more with the legal and business professions and with the public more generally. In this and other lectures, we're bringing to Champaign a large number of thought leaders who are doing more than simply thinking about the law, po policy, governance, and related questions, but who are toiling in the vineyard, so to speak. Lectures like this one from distinguished judges, lawyers, business persons, statespersons, and entrepreneurs can help complement and in some ways counteract the removed sense of the law one gets when studying it in the early phases of one's legal education. Often when I and other academics think about the value that members of the profession can add to legal education, we tend to focus on the professional skills element. How does one go about effectively taking a deposition or drafting a license agreement or presenting expert testimony, etc.? But when I went, went out to dinner last night with today's speaker, I was reminded of an even more fundamental sense in which we need people who are toiling in the vineyard uh, to engage with us, and that is to remind us what law really means to the lives of people. Learning doctrine is important, no doubt. I spend a lot of my life focused on it, and so is learning technique. But learning more deeply what is really at stake in what we all do and reminding ourselves in concrete terms of why we were drawn to this profession, that is indispensable. And I can't imagine anyone better to speak to us on those foundational issues than this afternoon's speaker, uh, Justice Jesse Reyes. Justice Reyes is uh, a jurist on the Illinois Appellate Court First District and former presiding justice of the Fifth Division. I first met him last year at the Unity Bar Dinner in Chicago, which is a terrific event that he is quite largely responsible for that generates countless goodwill and also tens of thousands of dollars to help law students pursue their passions. Justice Reyes has been on the bench for 20 years now since 1997, having previously served both as an associate judge and an elected judge of the Circuit Court of Cook County. He's the first Latino judge to be elect elected to the Illinois Appellate Court. Uh, and in, in uh, the 2012 election in which that uh, uh, happened, he actually filled the vacancy created by the retirement of Sheila Anderson, who some of you know is the wife of our, our alum and federal district court judge, Wayne Anderson, both of whom have done a great deal for this university. So it's only fitting uh, that Justice Reyes becomes part of our College of Law family as well, and we're delighted to welcome him into that today. Before his judicial career, Justice Reyes worked with the Law Department of the Chicago Board of Education and the Corporation Counsel's Office for the City of Chicago. He is the recipient of several awards for his distinguished service to the bench and bar, with special recognition for his efforts in promoting diversity in the legal profession. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois at Chicago, our sister campus, and his JD degree from the John Marshall Law School in Chicago. Perhaps more important than all that, as I I was reminded last night, Justice Reyes is one of the most charming, engaging, wide-ranging, and socially committed people you will ever encounter with a wealth of interesting non-judicial and non-legal experiences and interests, and it's really our honor to have him here today to share his insights, so join me in welcoming him. As is customary, Justice Reyes will, will talk for 20, 25 minutes and then uh, be happy to open it up to uh, uh, more of a conversation. Thanks. Well, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes? All right. Uh, Dean Amar, thank you again for the inv uh, invitation. I want to thank uh, the University of Illinois School of Law as well for uh, allowing me this uh, short amount of time to, to speak to our student body. And uh, I also want to thank you for that uh, very kind and uh, uh, generous uh, uh, introduction. And I'm glad that you uh, uh, read it the way I wrote it. <laughs> uh, 
couple of things before I start. Uh, one is um, we'll take questions and answers, and feel free, you know, it doesn't have to pertain to my remarks today, but uh, anything that uh, might be on your mind that you might be interested in, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to answer uh, your question. As long as it's not about a pending case that's in the, in the appellate court or one of my cases that may be up uh, on the Supreme Court. But other than that, it's, it's, uh, it's a fair game. Uh, also, um, what I'm about to talk to you about today it's not intended to depress you, but to inform you. And it's, all, uh, it's uh, these two items that I'm going to talk about. Is, uh, I'm going to just provide you an, an overview. Uh, I mean, actually, I could spend hours and hours and hours talking about uh, these two particular areas that are very near and dear to me. Uh, but I'm just going to give you a very short capsule of uh, some of my thoughts uh, regarding diversity and then also our profession in terms of uh, um, large segment of our population that we have uh, virtually neglected. Uh, in the words of uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, society as a whole benefits immeasurably from a climate in which all persons, regardless of race or gender, may have the opportunity to earn respect, responsibility, advancement, and remuneration based on ability. We, the legal profession, are a profession of leaders and problem solvers who are sworn to protect, preserve, promulgate fairness. We are also a profession committed to equality, to social mobility, to opportunity for all groups. Thus, advancing diversity in the legal profession is essential to sustaining a legal system that accurately represents the voice of the American people. Therefore, the ranks of the legal profession needs to be as inclusive and diverse as society it serves. What does this society look like? Well, based on the 2014 census, the U.S. Census uh, Bureau projects that around the time when the 2020 census is conducted, more than half of the nation's children are expected to be part of a minority race or ethnic group. The U.S. population as a whole is expected to follow a similar trend, becoming majority minority in 2044. The minority population is projected to rise to 56% of the total in 2060, compared with 38% in 2014. In a recent article published this past July in Crane's Chicago Business, the author Greg Hines provides that the metropolitan Chicago area is just a few years away from becoming majority non-white. This article cites a new analysis of the U.S. Census Board data by the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, which stated that between 2005 and 2016, the seven-county region moved from 55% white to 51% white. More specifically, Latinos are now the second largest ethnic or racial group in the Chicagoland region, having surpassed African Americans, while Asian Americans are fast closing in on being the third largest ethnic group in the study. According to Cranes, if these trends continue, the area will be majority minority within five years. Some experts, however, are even predicting it may be possible for the shift to occur before that time uh, and before the uh, uh, census conducted in 2020. These demographic shifts also have impacted our corporate America. From 2000 to 2015, buying power for African American households increased by 78%. For Latino households, the increase was 14%, and for Asian American households, the increase was 160%. In 2012, only three Fortune 500 companies had a chief diversity officer. By 2015, more than 75% of those companies had a chief diversity officer. While society seems to be diversifying by leaps and bounds, the same cannot be said for the legal profession. Despite the legal community's efforts thus far, racial and ethnic groups, sexual and gender minorities, and lawyers with disabilities continue to be vastly underrepresented in the legal profession. Law 360, which is a legal service, a new service, uh, last year reported that the legal profession remains 
by some measures the least diverse profession in the United States. Proving resistant to, mod, uh, to broader geographic shifts which demonstrate a generation of uh, workplace uh, diversity initiatives, meaning that law firms, bar associations, and so on and so forth have been trying to promulgate uh, diversity but have not been successful. In fact, the data from the last economic uh, survey conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau sets forth that 81% of the legal profession employees are white, making it the least diverse among white collar uh, professions tracked by the agency, including engineering, architecture, and uh, financial services. Breaking this information uh, down further, Law 360 reports that uh, striking lack of diversity in large U.S. law firms, with minorities making up only 15% of all lawyers. At the partnership level, the disparity becomes even uh, starker, with 8.4% of all partners and 7.6% of equity partners among law firms surveyed identifying themselves as minorities. While the law is not the only profession which struggles with diversity, the profession's current status as one of the least diverse is for uh, many something of a perplexing dilemma, given the profession's expertise on diversity and discrimination and the legal community's long commitment to promoting inclusion within its own ranks. While there may be many different reasons for the lack of diversity in large law firms, diversity experts point to three factors that have kept scores of law firms' diversity initiatives from gaining ground. They are, one, structural problem, two, a failure of leadership, and three, the downward spiral. The structural problem, let's take a look at that. It's not for lack of trying, as we said before, why law firms have failed to make notable progress on diversity. Many law firms have diversity committees, they have diversity officers, they have professionals dedicated to addressing the question. But law firms in particular still struggle to move the needle, and recruitment is typically not the problem. Instead, most law firms have difficulty retaining minority attorneys. The evidence suggests that unconscious bias and exclusion from informal networks of support and client development remain a common problem. Bias presents a challenge in many workplaces. But in the law firm, the way associates are assigned work and the way their skills are developed and evaluated by partners only serves to reinforce the bias. Albeit it's implicit, it still exists. And most law firms have few safeguards to address or limit the problem. For example, for most law firms, associates get their career-changing opportunities to work on the big cases largely through a free market system within the law firm, where partners can choose whoever they want to staff their teams, the plum assignments, sharpen their legal skills, and build connections to clients that dramatically boost their careers. While partners may not intentionally set out to exclude minorities from those assignments, particularly in high-stake, fast-paced cases where partners have to quickly staff up without much time for reflection, partners may fail to notice any bias that may be playing a, a role in their decision-making and fail to adequately consider that all possible uh, associates who could do the job just as well. A failure of leadership. For any initiative to be successful, firms need leaders with not only a strong commitment to making it work, but also with a strong management skills and abilities. Other industries have learned the importance of promoting individuals with naturally strong leadership skills, as well as training those individuals in the core competencies required to be adept managers and chief executive officers. But law firm leaders tend to be selected from within the ranks of the firms, and they usually are the rainmakers, who may or may not have picked up the necessary skills along the way to also be good managers. Powerful partners with highly profitable books of business also are virtually untouchable in many law firms, creating a problem of accountability 
when it comes to revamping organizational structures and associate to partner dynamics at large firms. Any diversity initiative needs both commitment and a planning for strong leaders, as well as a system that holds the managers and partners accountable for success of those programs. In addition, the behavior of those high-ranking individuals uh, within the firms is key in an effort to decrease the diversity. Leaders have to be publicly accountable for their actions within the firm. The downward spiral. The legal profession's ongoing struggle to uh, increase diversity in the profession also can lead to a downward spiral in the diversity numbers by creating the impression that talented individuals should look elsewhere if they want to have opportunities for advancement. If a law firm fails to adequately limit the problems of bias and leaders are unable to or unwilling to ensure that minority associates are able to secure vital opportunities to develop their skills and talents, diversity problem will continue to grow. Talented individuals not only won't want to stay, they'll move on and may possibly even go into other professions. There's one segment of our legal community I want to point out because there's a lot of statistics and information uh, with regards to this uh, segment of our uh, community, and that's women in large firms. While large firms are dedicated to the advancement of women, they sponsor women events, they host gender equality initiatives, they hold large women conferences, yet when you look behind the fluff, the data does not support the assertion that any material progress has been made for women in law firms. Since 1991, women have made up nearly half of law school graduates and new associates, and yet women have not materially advanced inside major law firms. Based on the 2015 report of the ninth annual National Association of Women Lawyers Survey on Retention and Promotion of Women in the Law, the following statistics were provided. In 2006, the percentage of women associates was at 45%. In 2015, it was down to 44%. The percentage of women equity partners in law firms throughout the country in 2006 was 16%. In 2015, it went up to 18%. The percentage of women non-equity partners in law firms around the country in 2006 was 26%. And in 2015, it was 28%. At this rate, women equity partners will not reach 30% uh, until 2081. The typical firm has two women and eight men on their uh, governance committee. And a typical female equity partner earns about 80% of what the typical male equity partner earns. It appears as though gender disparity does indeed still live among us, and despite all the protestations to the contrary, it is thriving. Now, why does diversity matter? No one can seriously question that life's experiences of people differ and that those differences impact on individuals' views and perceptions. In other words, we all do not view the world in the same way. In fact, this common sense premise that has shaped the increasing body of law protecting a litigant's fundamental right to a true jury of their peers. Diversity not only makes good business sense, it is also paramount in demonstrating that fair representation and equal access are necessary for justice, a foundational tenet of our legal profession. The success of any legal practice is based on its ability to understand and meet the needs of its clients, whether your clients are individuals or organizations, large or small, the need for diversity in the legal profession is growing. From a more altruistic view, lawyers have played an important role throughout history. Our nation continues to shape and frame by legal professions. Not only judges and lawyers, but our communities are also shaped by our politicians. Of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, 25 are lawyers. And of the 55 framers of the Constitution, 32 were lawyers. In the current 115th Congress, 218 of the lawmakers are lawyers. 
Even more, 25 of the 45 presidents that we've had um, were lawyers. Remember, a lawyer wrote the Declaration of Independence, and a lawyer wrote the Emancipation Proclamation, two of the cornerstone documents of our democracy. The legal profession has and continues to be an important profession for the maintenance of our society. Thus, maintaining our society means being sensitive to and reflective of the diverse country we live in. Furthermore, focusing for the uh, moment on the lawyer's role as an officer of court, it seems clear that such a role is consistent with the position that the law and its agents ought to be active mechanisms for achieving and defining social justice. Diversity, however, um, not only matters in law firms, but it also matters in the corporate sector as well as in our judiciary. The lack of uh, uh, diversity is very significant in our state courts. The United States um, basically handles more cases and more uh, motions uh, through its state courts than through the federal courts. Uh, Americans, however, when they enter a courtroom, often face a predictable presence on the bench, a white male. Not that there's anything wrong with my white males, but this is a common reoccurrence that appears in our court systems. This is the case despite increasing diversity within our law schools, and in our population and within the cross state uh, bars in our country. Most of the legal disputes adjudicated in America are heard in the state courts, and as I stated before, a broad range of uh, constituencies and increasing diverse public. So why are state courts lack, are lacking uh, diversity? Well, uh, number one, uh, in many situations, we have what's known as merit selection. And you have to look at who are the people that select the judges, right? And they tend to reflect the people that do the appointing. Number two, elections are becoming more and more expensive. Um, some jurisdictions have limited the, the amount that can be uh, expended in uh, um, um, judicial races. But uh, again, um, it's those that have the funds that seem to be able to per, uh, prevail, present company excluded. Uh, Diversity on the federal bench, um, while uh, it has been a little bit better, um, it still uh, leaves for, for, for more and want. Um, but you have to remember that every decision federal judges render, uh, are, they go from procedural motions to sentences to uh, appellate level judgments, um, have far reaching impacts on, on individuals uh, within our community. A more diverse federal bench would bring a greater diversity of experiences, understandings, and perspectives uh, to the application and development of the law. A deeper or better understanding of diverse groups is imperative to a judiciary that renders decisions that affect the lives of diverse individuals in and out of the courtroom on a daily basis. And one way to increase this is to understand that we need a more diverse uh, bench. The lack of diversity in the U.S. federal judiciary still presents, um, still presents a problem where we need to pr provide improvements. And compared with the U.S. population, men and minorities, and uh, um, uh, men of color and women and minorities have long been underrepresented. As tracked by the Federal um, Judicial Center uh, during the judiciary's 225-year history, Approximately 3,294 individuals have been appointed to the various levels of Article III system. The racial and ethnic uh, diversity of the nation's federal courts is slightly better than our nation's state courts. Of the 1,352 active and semi-retired federal judges, 60% are white, while only 11% are black, 7% are Latino, and just one quarter of federal judges are women and a mere 7% of federal judges are held by women of color, according to the research conducted by the Center for American Progress Report. Now, during his term in office, President Obama had appointed more women and minorities in total than any other president before him, with the exception of African Americans, of whom President Bill Clinton had appointed two more, according to Minority Corporate Council Association reports. Obama appointed more Asian Pacific Americans 
than the combined total of all prior administrations, and he appointed 130 women, while an aggregate of 294 had been appointed by all presidents before him. Notwithstanding these accomplishments, the federal courts still have a long way to go. And unfortunately, a current administration is trying to drastically uh, diminish these numbers uh, through uh, President Trump's uh, uh, current uh, uh, efforts. Um, now, why is this important in terms of uh, the people who sit in the district courts? Well, it's because they select the magistrates and the bankruptcy judges, all right? While they, the federal judiciary might be a little more diverse, uh, the magistrate and bankruptcy courts actually lag wo woefully behind. Um, and you have to remember that magistrate judges are the ones who sit in on basically all the cases that the federal district court judges do not want, but they also handle a variety of different matters, and even in some cases, civil, uh, civil matters. Bankruptcy court judges handle all matters pertaining to bankruptcy issues. Um, so we need, uh, we need to make a lot of changes here with regards to the way uh, business is conducted within our law firms and the way our courtrooms look. Um, I want to move on to um, my next topic. I've got a few more other things on, on diversity, but I think you get the point um, with regards to what's going on in our profession and in our society. But um, one of the things that I want to raise is if you look at individuals like Alexander Hamilton, Abraham Lincoln, and the fictional um, lawyer that many people try to aspire to, is uh, uh, Atticus Finch. Uh, they represent certain beliefs and uh, traits about our profession uh, that I think that we should uh, honor and, and um, move forward and, and uh, try to emulate. Um, you know, in doing my research, one of the things that I found out about Alexander Hamilton, other than going to see the play, um, <laughs> is that he was actually a very uh, important uh, lawyer in his time. Uh, in fact, Hamilton was regarded as one of the premier lawyers of our early republic and was certainly a premier uh, lawyer in New York. Hamilton, throughout his career, had an extensive law practice until his death in 1804. He handled a variety of matters, including contracts, creditor rights, admiralty, uh, maritime insurance, and constitutional law. Yet Hamilton seemed relatively indifferent to money and many of his contemporaries expressed amazement at his reasonable fees. The Duke uh, Leah Court um, said the following, the lack of interest in money, rare anywhere, but even in America, is one of the most universally recognized traits of Mr. Hamilton. Although his current practice is quite lucrative, I want to repeat that, quite lucrative, I've heard his clients say that their sole quibble with him is the modesty of the fees that he asks. Hamilton sometimes represented poor people in criminal cases on a pro bono basis, or was paid sometimes with the barrel of a ham or pork. Unlike many lawyers today, Hamilton represented clients only if he believed in their innocence. Perhaps Hamilton was motivated by something greater than the paper that would later bear his likeness. As, and don't worry, I'm not going to sing this. As Lynn Miranda uh, would sing centuries later, I practiced the law, I practically perfected it. I've seen injustice in the world, and I've corrected it. Abraham Lincoln, everybody knows as a president, right? One of our most distinguished presidents, the 16th president of the United States. But very few people know what type of a lawyer he really was. He represented the poor. He represented the rich, he represented corporate America at that time, and he represented the small uh, merchant. But Abraham Lincoln also followed suit with, with Hamilton. He charged reasonable fees, and the client was able to provide him with uh, the fees at the time. He took whatever there was in terms of substitution. He also sometimes didn't take a fee and didn't receive a fee until the client was able to um, provide um, the fee to, for him for his services. Now, in the novel, To Kill a Mockingbird, 
written by Harper Lee. Atticus Finch, the protagonist, does everyone had a, know who Atticus Finch is, anyone? Yeah? No? Yes? Okay. All right. Some of you do. All right. Um, the protagonist is many things to many people. He's an understanding father, a caring neighbor, but for our purposes, more importantly, he's an honorable lawyer and a role model to us all. When his client, Walter Cunningham, cannot come up with the payment for Atticus services, Finch accepts payment in vegetables and in other things with no hesitation, ever willing to accept nothing at all. When Walter said, Mr. Finch, I don't know when I'll ever be able to pay you, Atticus replied by saying, let that be the least of your worries, Walter. The preamble to the United States Constitution promises to establish justice. In the Pledge of Allegiance, we vow justice for all. The American Bar Association motto states that it is pursuing justice. Are these just mere words on paper? Unfortunately, to certain segments of our society, that's exactly what they are. But to Hamilton, to Lincoln, and to Finch, they were more than just words. Unfortunately, throughout the years, there's a large segment of our population who has gone underrepresented or not represented at all. And what I'm referring to is the middle class and the working class. You know, there was a time when only lawyers closed a real estate sale or gave advice in, in estate planning. Now lawyers must compete with accountants, real estate agents, title insurance companies, and bankers. In some states, no fault insurance has been made easier for an individual to collect for minor collision by just making a phone call. The underlying changes to our profession and the, what our profession is grappling with is the most profound catalyst of our times, the digital revolution. The digital revolution has transformed how the world connects, communicates, and computes. Today's lawyers are finding themselves competing with legal services provided over the internet. The advent of the internet has also made mass production of mortgages, wills, and estates easily available through legal software, downloadable by anybody with a tablet. Consider that this same accessibility to documents makes the formation of a simple corporation, a partnership, matters that the paralegals can easily handle. Consider also that today anyone with a smartphone has easier access to legal sources than most individuals did in the past. The digital revolution is also producing a public that demands delivery of legal services with greater speed and efficiency and at less cost than ever before. The world of the internet is a fast world, as we all know. Consumers of legal services, be they multinational corporations or individuals, are not prepared or willing to wait for results. The time-honored legal service of, with due deliberation is no longer in existence and no longer in place. The face-to-face -face consultations and advice that is the hallmark of the lawyer's trade is being replaced by new technology driven by alternatives. Personally, from a standpoint of having been a trial judge, I saw this sadly on a daily basis when I had to handle mortgage foreclosure cases. And many, many individuals weren't able to afford lawyers and they came in and represented themselves. And as a jurist, unfortunately, sometimes it like, would be like watching a car wreck. You saw that they shouldn't be doing what they're doing, but yet there was nothing that you could do because you can't give them any advice. You might want to be able to give them direction. You might want to continue the case so maybe you know, they'll get an opportunity to talk to somebody. But this wasn't only limited to mortgage foreclosures. It happens in probate court. 80% of the cases that are filed in probate court, uh, the individuals are entering the courtroom pro se. The same thing with regards to domestic relations. And as I said before, a simple contract may be a simple contract for the person who's trying to get you to sign the contract. But then when you sign the contract and find out later on that there's some clauses, some provisions that are going to be harmful to you in the future. It was the time that you should have talked to a lawyer instead of just going by and signing a simple contract. Lawyering is a relationship, not a commodity. The internet does not sell the concern of the lawyer for his clients or deliver them much peace of mind. The only one that could do that is the lawyer himself or herself. 
Now, there's a lot of uh, um, individuals, experts, uh, so on and so forth out there that are saying, well, I have the answer to the problem of, you know, people not getting legal services. But they seem to be pointing towards technology. Um, Richard Seskine in uh, Tomorrow's uh, Lawyer uh, said that uh, Watson, um, and for those of you who are not familiar, Watson is a computer that was uh, created by IBM. Uh, a couple years ago, Watson uh, uh, got a lot of fame because it competed against uh, two uh, outstanding individuals in a Jeopardy match, and Watson won. So, you know, Watson is, is thought to be a computer that now can, can think, not only compute, but can think like a human being and be able to think like a human being faster than a human being. Um, but Suskind believes that Watson's going to replace us all. It's going to replace you as practicing lawyers and me as a judge. Uh, hopefully I won't see that day, but uh, recently in a book uh, titled Rebooting Justice, two uh, uh, the authors, actually two law professors, all right, uh, have said that the problem with our profession is that we have too many lawyers, all right? We need less lawyers. And what we need to do is to realize that we have to adapt to technology and utilize technology with services as I mentioned before, real estate, you know, things of that man, uh, nature. But technology is the, uh, is the answer. Um, I totally disagree with that. I still believe, like Hamilton, like Lincoln, and like Finch, it's the face-to-face. -face. It's the responsibility of all of us as professionals, all right? We forget that we are not only just attorneys, but we are counselors of the law. What does that mean? We counsel. We advise. You know, we, even if it turns out that they don't use our services, one of our obligations as a member of the legal profession is to make sure that we have done our jobs and prevented someone from having to um, go to court if, if uh, it was unnecessary. Um, one of the things I want to uh, close with, because I know my time is running out, um, is that in To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, during, the, during the time of, of the trial of, of Tom Reynolds, um, Atticus's uh, uh, sister comes to babysit his, his children or, or watch his children. And she's having a conversation with one of the neighbors. And they're saying, you know, you know how brave Atticus is taking on this case, right, representing this man who's been accused of, of, of rape. Um, and uh, uh, this, the, the, the woman meant that, you know, that he's doing this is courageously, right, because he's going to lose, right? But the sisters saw it as, no, he is courageous, but he's courageous because he is doing what the rest of us don't have the courage to do, is to stand up for this man. And that's what we do as lawyers. And that's what we're supposed to do as lawyers. We are the ones that are supposed to speak for those who can't speak for themselves. That's what we swore to do the day we become lawyers, and that's what we should continue doing the rest of our time as members of this profession. Uh, so I want to thank you, and I'd be more than happy to take uh, any questions anybody has. Can I go over? Oh, yeah? All right.